Hi everyone. This week we're going to look a little bit at some of the religions of Oceania, America, and Africa, that is, religious traditions that arose in those areas. And we're just going to pick out a few samples and look at them uh, briefly um, before we shift to what you might call world religions or religions that have been around for maybe in some cases thousands of years and have spread over the entire world. Um, before we do that, I want to remind you of a couple of things. First of all, make sure that you look at the class website on a regular basis. Uh, you can find the URL for the class website in the syllabus and also on Blackboard. In particular, for the purposes of these videos that I'm making, uh, make sure that you look uh, under the link that says exam study guides and look at the, for now, look at the one that says class notes unit one. Some of the things I'll be talking about in these videos, like this one, are going to be found in class notes, uh, the class notes for unit one. And so I would suggest that you either print them out or have them on your screen so you can scroll along with me as I go over some of this material. Now, I'm not going to cover all the material that's in the class notes. Uh, nevertheless, uh, it's in some, some things I'm going to be talking about. I'll give some definitions. I'll, you know, maybe I'll have a list of various things I want to talk about. And since I don't have a, a whiteboard, at least at the moment, I don't have a whiteboard in my, uh, in my home office here. I may write some stuff down on a, a piece of paper and show it to you, and I may get a whiteboard later on. But uh, since you have a lot of these things in your class notes, you don't have to write it down yourself in your own personal notes. You can just refer to the class notes for Unit 1. Uh, also, I want to point out, um, oh, well, let me say something about the textbook. The textbook, as I said last time, is uh, Introducing World Religions by Victoria Orobshiro. And this is obviously the hard copy of it. You can also get the book um, electronically if you prefer to do that. And there's a link to it on the class website. It's essentially the same text, just an electronic version of it with some links to various places, um, uh, various other websites uh, that might be of interest to you. I've also added a little section on the website called Religion in the News. And I have uh, links to various websites that focus exclusively on religion news around the world. And so you might be interested in looking at those from time to time. As I run across specific articles that seem timely or interesting, uh, I'm going to put those uh, under religion and news under the heading that says um, articles. Okay, so um, under the schedule part of the class website, we're in week two now, of course. And let me remind you that you have assigned readings every week, uh, at least for the first 10 weeks. You have assigned readings in the textbook. IWR means Introducing World Religions. That's the textbook I just showed you. So for this week, I want you to read chapters 2 and 3. Chapter 2 deals with religious traditions of Oceania, America, and Africa. And uh, the author gives a number of interesting examples there. And because uh, she gives a lot of examples, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time in this video going over them because you're able to read yourself. However, uh, on the class website for week two, under assignments due, I also have a number of uh, links to videos that are online. And um, so, for example, there are links this week uh, to Maori tattoos. So is, these are uh, expressive traditions. Uh, Maori is from, uh, these are the native people of New Zealand. Uh, there's a link to Australian Aboriginal Dreaming, the Sioux Ghost Dance, Navajo Sand Painting, uh, and so forth. I'm not going to read all of those to you, but make sure you watch the videos, and it'll give you some uh, kind of visual hint about uh, some of these expressive traditions that we find in Oceania, America, and Africa. Okay, uh, I want to talk a little bit today. I want to mention a, a couple of things, a couple of more things of an introductory nature about religious studies. Um, the first thing I want to mention is the distinction between scholars of religion 
who consider themselves religionists and scholars of religion who consider themselves reductionists. And of course, there are those who are in the middle too, but it's easier to define the uh, sort of the extremes. Religionists are those who see religion as a unique phenomenon, different from every other type of social phenomenon. So, you know, in society, we have a lot of social structures. We have clubs and we have uh, sports teams and we have, you know, at in, in university, you have uh, fraternities and sororities. You have uh, uh, different groups that you may be members of. You may have volunteer groups, things like that. But for religionists, uh, churches, synagogues, temples, things like this, uh, religious organizations are, they see, religionists see these things as unique. They see religion itself as in a class all by itself. So religion can certainly be compared to other social structures, religionists would say, but they are unique. All right. On the other hand, um, in opposition to religionists are those who might be called reductionists. That is, they reduce religion to a purely social phenomenon like many other social phenomena. Uh, there's the family, there's government, social clubs, uh, all these other things, uh, groups that I mentioned earlier. For reductionists, religion is just another uh, social phenomenon that can be analyzed like many others. Um, and uh, for the purposes of this class, we're going to try to strike a middle ground. Um, I'm, uh, I myself am not a religionist or a reductionist. I see, I see some value in both of these approaches to religious studies. Uh, the main thing that I want to emphasize for purposes of our class is that we will be looking at a phenomenological approach to religion. I think I may have said this last time, but it, it bears repeating. A phenomenological approach means we look at the phenomenon of religion. How does it manifest itself? Uh, as I said last time, last week, I won't, we're not going to be evaluating truth claims about of religions. We'll talk about some of the truth claims, like uh, a Christian truth claim is that Jesus rose from the dead. A, uh, a Muslim truth claim is that Muhammad is the greatest prophet of all time. Um, and there are many other truth claims. Every religion has truth claims. So in our class, we'll be talking about the truth claims, but we won't be evaluating them to see which are, uh, which are more valid than others. That's not the point. We're, we will just point out that uh, different religious traditions have different truth claims, and it's up to the individual person uh, to decide on the truth or falsity or relative truth even of some of these truth claims. So again, we're taking a phenomenological approach to religion. One um, last thing of, um, of, of an introductory nature that I want to get into is the nature of the sacred and the profane. Uh, sacred means having to do with religion, having to do with the gods or the divine or anything that is supra-human, beyond the human, uh, normal human experience. And whereas profane is just, just means ordinary. It doesn't, it's not like the word profanity in English. It's, you know, saying bad words or something like that. Profane, in this sense, in contrast to the sacred, the profane is everything else, everything that's just normal. Our ordinary human existence is uh, profane existence. And so religious traditions talk about the sacred. They talk about things that are beyond ordinary human ex ex uh, experience. Remember last time when we talked about definitions of religion, um, what I said that we were going to use for our working definition in this class um, had to do, uh, one, of, one of the characteristics of it was that uh, a religion is something uh, where the people in the group um, acknowledge the existence of something beyond ordinary human experience. And that's what the sacred is. It can be defined in a variety of ways, but at a minimum, it's something beyond ordinary human experience. So, for example, there is sacred time. These are times of the year, uh, specific days, sometimes whole years, something like that, that are different from ordinary times. So, like for Jews, the Sabbath is a sacred day. For Muslims, the sacred day is Friday. 
There is uh, the holy month of Ramadan in Islam. There's Advent in Christianity. Uh, there's Diwali in Hinduism and other Eastern traditions. So these are sacred times. Sacred space refers to places on the physical earth that are considered to be holy in some sense. So in the Western world, we talk about the Holy Land, uh, the land of uh, Israel and Palestine, uh, the city of Jerusalem, for example, which is sacred to three religious traditions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. But there are many other sacred places as well. The Black Hills in uh, South Dakota are sacred to the Sioux, uh, Sioux Indians who live there. Uh, many of their people still live there. In Australia, there is uh, something the Europeans called Ayers Rock, but the Aboriginal Australians call Uluru, which is a sacred rock in the middle of the, the middle of the continent, middle of the country, that is sacred to at least some of the Aboriginal people who live there. There are uh, sacred symbols and artifacts. So if you think about what are some of the sacred symbols, uh, if you look on the class website, you'll see some of them in that in that picture at the top of the class website. But you know you can think of a cross, a star of David, the wheel of Dharma, which is sacred and uh, represents the sacred in Hinduism. There's the yin yang, which is sacred, a sacred symbol in uh, Taoism, and so forth. Uh, even the um, <coughs> even the swastika, which the the Nazis uh, in Germany during World War II, during and before World War II, uh, adopted as their as their symbol, and we see it today, and we think of it as just a, a horrible symbol of hatred and bigotry and oppression. Um, this symbol actually dates way back, long before the Nazis. Uh, in Eastern religious traditions, it's, it's a symbol that means good luck, good fortune. So symbols can sometimes change, and in different cultures, different symbols mean different things. Uh, there are sacred interactions. So a worship service is a sacred interaction because the ordinary humans interact with the divine in worship in some way. A ritual sacrifice is a type of sacred interaction. Uh, a ghost dance uh, or some kind of sacred dance, some other kind of sacred dance. Uh, these are all examples of sacred interactions, right? There are sacred personages. And I'm not here talking just about the gods. Certainly the gods, uh, the gods and goddesses, are considered sacred personages in those religious traditions that have gods and goddesses, which is most of the ones we'll talk about. But um, also, um, sometimes sacred personages bleed over into individual people, you know, human beings as well. So uh, Zoroaster, the prophet of Zoroastrianism, is considered a sacred personage in some sense. Jesus is in Christianity. Muhammad is in Islam. It doesn't mean that, that Muslims think of Muhammad the same way that Christians think of Jesus. They don't. Uh, because for most Christians, Jesus is a divine figure as well as human, whereas for Muslims, uh, Muhammad is not divine. He is human. He's a prophet, the greatest of the prophets, but still human. Uh, in Hinduism, sacred personages would include some of the, uh, the avatars. Uh, whenever Krishna, Lord Krishna, reveals himself in human form, for example, or uh, in Confucianism in China, Confucius is a a sacred personage of some sort. And finally, the last um, one of these sacred areas I want to talk about, uh, I call sacred meta time or meta space. Meta means beyond in this sense. So uh, it's not, it's like sacred time and space, but it's beyond ordinary time and space. So the time before the creation of the universe, uh, the time uh, after uh, people die. Heaven and hell, these are sacred metaspaces in Hinduism. The Brahman is beyond the cycle of uh, reincarnation. Uh, eventually you get to the Brahman. Uh, sacred metatime and metaspace refer to dimensions outside those normally perceived by human beings. All right, so I think that's all I want to say about uh, it is a matter of introduction, and on the religious traditions of Oceania, America, and Africa, let me remind you to read uh, the textbook, Chapter 2, and she will give, uh, the author will give several examples of expressive traditions 
We'll also discuss them some in some of the um, discussion board questions this week.